Good evening. Welcome to sleep chamber. It is what it is. What happens, happens. And as for now, there's nothing you can do. Colors are one of the most important aspects of our lives. They can affect our moods, our emotions, and even our physical well-being. The way do colors come from? Most people believe that colors are created by light. When light hits an object, it reflects off the object and into our eyes. The light waves that are reflected determine the color that we see. For example, blue light has shorter waves than red light. That's why blue objects look blue to us. But light is not the only source of colors. Some colors are created by chemicals. For example, when you see a fire, the flames are actually red because of the chemicals in the fire. Colors can also be created by electricity. For example, when you see a TV or computer screen, the colors are created by electricity. So, as you can see, there are many ways that colors can be created. And each method creates a different type of color. The wire color is important to us. Colors are important because they help us to see the world around us. They can also help us to communicate our feelings. For example, the color red can represent danger or anger. The color blue can represent calm or sadness. Colors can also have a positive effect on our moods. For example, the color yellow is often associated with happiness. The color green is often associated with nature and peace. So, as you can see, colors are important for many reasons. They can help us to see the world around us, communicate our feelings, and even improve our moods. The color blue has always been one of my favorites. There is something about the way it makes me feel that is indescribable. It is the color of the sky and the ocean, and it has always been associated with peace and serenity. When I was a child, my bedroom was painted blue. I would lay in bed and stare at the ceiling, dreaming of the places I would go and the things I would see. The blue sky was always my favorite, and I would often imagine flying among the clouds. As I grew older, the color blue took on new meaning. It became the color of my dreams and aspirations. It was the color of hope and possibilities. Whenever I felt lost or alone, I would look to the blue sky and find comfort in its infinite expanse. Today, the color blue is a reminder of who I want to be. It is the color of my dreams and my future. It is the color of hope and possibility. 
Whenever I see it, I am reminded of the endless possibilities that lie ahead. When it comes to the color yellow, there are so many different things that come to mind. For some people, yellow is the color of sunshine and happiness. For others, it is the color of caution and warning. No matter what your association is with the color yellow, there is no denying that it is a unique and interesting color. For starters, yellow is one of the three primary colors. This means that it cannot be created by mixing other colors together. It also has a very specific wavelength on the light spectrum. All of these factors contribute to yellow being a very distinct and recognizable color. In addition to its scientific properties, yellow also has a lot of history and meaning behind it. In many cultures, yellow represents royalty or wealth. In others, it is seen as the color of happiness and good luck. No matter what your culture or background is, there is likely some sort of meaning or association attached to the color yellow. All in all, yellow is a complex and interesting color with a lot to offer. Whether you see it as positive or negative, there is no denying that it stands out from the rest. Yellow like the sun. The sun is the star at the center of the solar system. It is the Earth's primary source of light and heat. The sun is a medium-sized star and is about halfway through its life. It has a diameter of about 1.4 million kilometers and is about 150,000 times the size of the Earth. The sun is made up of hydrogen and helium. It is so hot that the hydrogen atoms fuse together to form helium atoms. This process releases a huge amount of energy. The sun's surface temperature is about 55 degrees Celsius. The sun produces a lot of ultraviolet radiation. This radiation can damage living things, including people. The sun also produces X-rays and gamma rays. These are even more harmful than ultraviolet radiation. The sun is essential for life on Earth. Without it, there would be no plants or animals. The sun's heat helps to keep the earth warm enough for life to exist. Plants need sunlight to grow. They use sunlight to make food for themselves and for animals. Animals need plants for food, so they would not be able to exist without the sun either. Humans have always been fascinated by the sun. Ancient cultures worshipped the sun as a god. The Egyptians believed that the sun was the god Ra. The Greeks believed that the sun was the god Apollo. The Romans believed that the sun was the god Sol. People have always looked to the sun for guidance. It is said that the sun never lies. The sun is a very important part of our lives. 
we should all take some time to appreciate it every day. When we appreciate something, we value it more. Appreciation can be given for things like a person's character, talents, possessions, or accomplishments. It can be given verbally, written, or through actions. The recipient of appreciation feels valued, important, and special. Appreciation is one of the most powerful forms of flattery. People often appreciate things that they cannot have or that are not easily attainable. This is because we know how difficult it is to obtain certain things. For example, we may appreciate a friend's new car because we cannot afford one ourselves. We may also appreciate a colleague's promotion because we did not get the job. When we appreciate someone, we are acknowledging their worth. We are also opening ourselves up to receiving appreciation in return. When we feel appreciated, we feel good about ourselves and our relationship with the other person. Appreciation is a two-way street that can lead to mutual respect and satisfaction. We can show our appreciation for others in many ways. We can compliment them, buy them a gift, or simply tell them how much we appreciate them. We can also show our appreciation through our actions. For example, we can go out of our way to help someone or do something nice for them. When we take the time to appreciate others, we make them feel good and we make ourselves feel good too. It's a win-win situation. In a win-win situation, both parties come out ahead. This can be achieved through compromise, negotiation, and working together towards a common goal. When each party feels like they have gotten something out of the deal, it is more likely that the agreement will be upheld and both sides will be happy with the result. A win-win situation can be created in many different ways. One way is through brainstorming and coming up with creative solutions to problems. If both sides are willing to put in the effort to come up with a solution that benefits everyone, it is more likely that a win-win situation can be reached. Another way to create a win-win situation is to be open and honest with each other about what each party wants and needs. If both sides are able to communicate effectively, it will be easier to find a solution that works for everyone. It is important to remember that in a win-win situation, both parties need to feel like they have gained something. This means that there needs to be give and take from both sides. One side cannot take all of the benefits for themselves. If one side tries to take advantage of the other, it is likely that the agreement will fall apart and no one will be happy with the outcome. A win-win situation is the best possible outcome of any situation because it means that everyone gets what they want. When both sides are happy with the agreement, it is more likely that it will be upheld and everyone will be satisfied. A lose-lose situation is one where there is no clear winner or loser and both parties end up feeling like they have lost something. This can happen in a number of different ways. For example, two friends may have a falling out and stop talking to each other. 
Both of them may feel like they have lost a friend, even though neither of them did anything wrong. Another example of a loose-loose situation is when two people are dating and they break up. Both of them may feel like they have lost something, even though they are the ones who decided to end the relationship. A loose-loose situation can also happen when two countries are at war. Both countries may suffer losses, even though neither of them wanted to go to war in the first place. Whatever the case may be, a lose-lose situation is one where there is no clear winner or loser and both parties end up feeling like they have lost something. A win-lose situation is when one person or party gains at the expense of another. This can happen in many different arenas, from business deals to personal relationships. It's the classic idea of one person's gain being another person's loss. In a business context, a win-lose situation might occur when one company buys another company out. The company that buys the other one usually does so because it's a cheaper way to get a hold of the other company's products or services or because it wants to eliminate a competitor. The company being bought usually doesn't fare so well since it's now under the control of the other company and may be dismantled or have its employees let go. In a personal relationship, a win-lose situation might happen when one person is always taking advantage of the other. For example, one person might always be borrowing money from the other without ever paying it back, or one person might be constantly taking advantage of the other's good nature by asking for favors all the time. These situations can be toxic and difficult to get out of. A win-lose situation can also be simply a matter of perspective. What one person sees as a win might be seen as a loss by someone else. For example, if you're trying to sell your house and you get an offer that's much lower than you were hoping for, you might see that as a loss. But the person buying your house might see it as a win since they're getting a good deal on the property. It's all a matter of perspective. In any case, a win-lose situation is usually not a good thing. It's usually better to find a win-win situation where both parties involved can benefit in some way. But sometimes a win-lose situation is unavoidable. And in those cases, it's important to try to make the best of it. A happy situation is one in which individuals feel content and satisfied. There are many things that can contribute to a person's happiness, and it differs from individual to individual. Some may find happiness in their work, while others may find it in their personal lives. Regardless of what it is that makes someone happy, it is important to remember that happiness is a state of mind. It is not determined by what is happening around us, but rather how we choose to perceive what is happening. In a happy situation, individuals often feel a sense of peace. They may feel content with their current situation, and they may be surrounded by positive people. Happy situations often involve a sense of community, as individuals feel connected to those around them. This sense of connection can be particularly strong in situations where individuals are working towards a common goal. In a happy situation, individuals often feel a sense of accomplishment. 
They may feel proud of what they have accomplished, and they may feel a sense of satisfaction in their work. They may also feel a sense of joy in their personal lives. This sense of joy may come from spending time with loved ones, experiencing new and exciting things, or from simply enjoying the moment. Happy situations are those in which individuals feel a sense of contentment. They may be surrounded by positive people and feel a sense of connection to those around them. They may also feel a sense of accomplishment and joy in their personal lives. Happiness is a state of mind, and it is important to remember that it is not determined by what is happening around us, but rather how we choose to perceive what is happening. It's not always easy to maintain a happy state of mind. Life has a way of throwing curveballs our way, and it's easy to get caught up in the negativity. But I think it's important to try to find the silver lining in every situation and to be grateful for the good in our lives. One way that I like to stay positive is by meditating. I find that taking even just five or 10 minutes to sit quietly and focus on my breath helps to clear my mind and center myself. I also like to journal and to write down three things that I'm grateful for each day. This helps me to remember all the good things that are happening in my life, even on days when things might be tough. I think it's also important to surround yourself with positive people. Spend time with people who make you laugh and who make you feel good about yourself. Avoid negative people who bring you down. This is easier said than done, but it's worth it to try to surround yourself with positive energy. Finally, I think it's important to live in the present as much as possible. Worrying about the future or dwelling on the past won't do us any good. Instead, try to focus on the here and now. Enjoy the moment you're in and don't take things for granted. If we can all strive to have a happy state of mind, I think the world would be a much better place. Love is one of the most discussed topics of all time. Is love really blind? Some say it is, some say it isn't. Let's explore both sides of the argument. On one hand, love is often said to be blind. This means that when we are in love, we often don't see the faults of the person we are with. We only see their good qualities. This can be a good thing as it can help us to overlook the small things that bother us about our partner. However, it can also be a bad thing. If we are too blind to see the faults of our partner, we may end up in a toxic relationship. On the other hand, some people say that love is not blind. They say that when we are in love, we are actually more aware of our partner's faults. We may even be more forgiving of their faults than we are of other people's. This can be a good thing as it can help us to build a stronger relationship. However, it can also be a bad thing. If we are too aware of our partner's faults, we may start to nitpick and dwell on them. 
This can lead to arguments and resentment. So, what is the truth? Is love blind or not? The answer may depend on the person. Some people may find that they are blind to their partner's faults, while others may find that they are more aware of them. Ultimately, it is up to the individual to decide whether love is blind or not. When most people think of love, they think of the passionate, butterflies-in-the-stomach kind of love. But there is another kind of love that is just as powerful, if not more so, platonic love. Platonic love is the kind of love that is based on mutual respect, admiration, and friendship. It is the kind of love that can last a lifetime. Platonic love is often misunderstood. People think that because it is not romantic, it must be less intense. But that is not the case. Platonic love can be just as passionate as any other kind of love. It is simply a different kind of passion. When you are in a platonic relationship, you are not thinking about what you can get from the other person. You are not thinking about how you can use them to satisfy your own needs. You are thinking about how you can help them to grow and to reach their potential. You are thinking about how you can make their life better. This is not to say that platonic love is always selfless. There are times when you will want something from the other person. But even then, your motivation is not selfish. You want what is best for them, even if it is not what is best for you. Platonic love is not easy. It requires work and sacrifice. But it is worth it. Platonic love is the kind of love that can change the world. Love is a many splendored thing, and there are different types of love for different types of people. You could be the type of person who loves your family unconditionally, or the type of person who loves your partner with every fiber of your being. Maybe you love your friends so much that you would do anything for them, or maybe you love your job and the satisfaction that it brings you. Whatever type of love you feel, it is all valid and all worth experiencing. One of the most common types of love is familial love. This is the love that you feel for your parents, your siblings, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles, and anyone else who is related to you by blood. This type of love is often seen as the strongest because it is the most pure. It is not based on anything other than the fact that you are related to this person. You love them simply because they are your family and you have known them your entire life. Another common type of love is romantic love. This is the love that you feel for your partner, and it is often seen as the most intense and passionate type of love. This is because romantic love is based on an emotional and physical connection between two people. When you are in love with someone, you are attracted to them both physically and emotionally, and you want to be with them all the time. You also tend to put their needs above your own, and you would do anything for them. 
Friendship love is another type of love that is very important. This is the love that you feel for your friends, and it is often seen as the most platonic and least intense type of love. This is because friendship love is based on a shared interest or connection between two people. When you are friends with someone, you enjoy spending time with them and doing things together. You also support each other and are there for each other during tough times. There are also different types of love that you can feel for things, such as your job or your hobbies. When you love your job, you enjoy going to work and you feel satisfaction from doing your job well. You also feel like you are doing something that is important and that has purpose. When you love your hobbies, you enjoy spending time doing them and you feel a sense of accomplishment from completing them. You also feel like you are doing something that is just for you and that you enjoy. No matter what type of love you feel, it is all valid and all worth experiencing. Love is what makes us human and it is what makes life worth living. There is no greater love than that between a dog and his owner. From the moment they meet, there is an instant connection that cannot be denied. The dog looks into the eyes of his owner and knows that he has found his forever home. The owner looks at the dog and sees all the potential in the world. They see a best friend, a confidante, and a loyal companion. They know that this dog will be by their side through thick and thin. The dog is always happy to see his owner, no matter what kind of day they've had. He is always ready to give kisses and cuddle. He wants nothing more than to make his owner happy. The owner always tries to do what's best for the dog. They make sure he is well fed and has a comfortable place to sleep. They take him for walks and play with him because they know how much he loves it. The dog is always there for the owner, even when no one else is. He is always ready to listen and offer a shoulder to cry on. He knows when his owner is sad and does everything he can to make them feel better. The love between a dog and his owner is truly special. It is a bond that can never be broken. They are best friends for life. All right, story time. It was the early morning of a beautiful day, and the perfect day for sailing. The sun was just peeking over the horizon and the breeze was blowing gently. The man had been preparing for this day for months, and everything was finally ready. He had provisioned his boat with enough food and water to last for weeks, and he had made sure that all of his navigation equipment was in good working order. He stepped onto his boat, untied the lines, and pushed off from the dock. He breathed a sigh of relief as he finally set sail on his long-awaited journey. The wind was blowing steadily, and he made good progress as he sailed out of the harbor and into the open ocean. For the first few days, everything went smoothly. He kept a close watch on his equipment and the weather, and he made sure to stay on course. 
He was making good time and was beginning to feel confident about the journey ahead. But then, on the fourth day, things took a turn for the worse. A storm began to brew on the horizon, and before long, it was upon him. The wind was howling and the waves were crashing against the boat. The man did everything he could to keep the boat steady, but it was taking a beating. He was forced to take shelter below deck, and he huddled there, worried for his safety. The storm raged on for hours, but eventually it began to die down. The man cautiously emerged from below deck to assess the damage. Thankfully, the boat had held up well, but he was now off course and would need to make some adjustments. Despite the setback, the man continued on with his journey. He was determined to reach his destination, and he knew that he could do it. With each passing day, he grew stronger and more confident, and eventually he reached his goal. He had sailed across the Atlantic. The Atlantic is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Its vastness and power are breathtaking, and its ability to soothe and calm is equally impressive. I have always been drawn to the ocean. As a child, I would spend hours upon hours gazing at the waves, dreaming of one day being able to swim in them. I never forgot that feeling, and even now as an adult, I find myself being pulled back to the Atlantic time and time again. There is something about the ocean that just makes me feel at peace. Whether I am watching the waves crash against the shore or feeling the sand between my toes, I always feel a sense of calm and relaxation. The Atlantic has a way of making all of my worries and stresses disappear. It is my happy place. Whenever I am feeling down or anxious, I know that a trip to the beach will always make me feel better. I am so grateful to live so close to the ocean. I am able to go for a swim or walk on the beach anytime I want, and I know that I am always going to feel better after spending some time by the water. I went surfing once when I was abroad. The sun was setting and the waves were crashing as I paddled out into the water. I could feel the excitement building inside of me as I waited for the perfect wave. Suddenly, I saw it coming and I paddled as fast as I could. I popped up on my board and rode the wave all the way in. As I came to a stop, I couldn't help but smile. There's something about surfing that just makes me feel alive. I paddled back out and waited for another wave. This time, I decided to go for a bigger one. I could feel the adrenaline pumping as I paddled harder and harder. I finally caught the wave and rode it all the way in. As I got up, I could feel the rush of adrenaline coursing through my body. I can't get enough of this feeling. I paddled back out and caught a few more waves. Each one giving me an incredible rush. I love getting adrenaline rushes. 
The first time I ever felt an adrenaline rush was when I was skydiving. I was so nervous beforehand, but as soon as I jumped out of the plane, all of my fears melted away. I felt like I was flying as I soared through the air, and it was one of the most exhilarating experiences of my life. Ever since then, I've been addicted to adrenaline. I love the feeling of my heart racing and the rush of energy that comes with it. I've bungee jumped, gone white water rafting, and even skydived again. Every time I push my boundaries and do something new, I feel alive in a way that I never have before. I know that some people might think I'm crazy for putting myself in dangerous situations, but for me, it's worth it. I'm living my life to the fullest and experiencing everything that I can. And I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything in the world. The best part about traveling is being able to explore new places and meet new people. There's something about being in a new place that just makes you feel alive. Even if it's just for a weekend, traveling can be a truly amazing experience. Whether you're taking a road trip to a nearby town or flying to a far off country, there's always something new to see and do. And, of course, there's always the food. Trying new dishes is one of the best parts about traveling, in my opinion. No matter how you travel, there's always an opportunity to learn something new. Whether you're learning about the history of a place or the customs of a new culture, there's always something to discover. And, of course, there's always the opportunity to simply relax and enjoy yourself. So, whether you're planning your next big adventure, or just dreaming about future travels, remember that there's always something new to see and do. And, of course, always enjoy the food. After a long and tiring journey, it is always nice to finally reach your destination. And what better way to relax and unwind them by taking in the sights and sounds of your new surroundings? Whether it is your first time in a new city or you are revisiting a favorite place, sightseeing is a great way to learn more about the culture and history of a place, as well as simply enjoying the beauty of your surroundings. There are many different ways to go about sightseeing. You can choose to do a self-guided tour, following a map or a guidebook, or you can opt for a guided tour led by a local expert. Whichever way you choose, there is no wrong way to sightsee. One of the best ways to really soak in the sights of a new place is by taking a leisurely stroll. This way, you can take your time to admire the architecture, the people, and the overall atmosphere of the place. Make sure to stop often to take photos and to simply take in the view. If you want to cover more ground in a shorter amount of time, then you can opt for a bike tour or a Segway tour. These are great ways to see a lot of the city in a relatively short amount of time. And, if you get tired, you can always hop off your bike or Segway and explore a particular area in more detail. No matter how you choose to sightsee, the important thing is to simply enjoy yourself. Take your time, explore, and make sure to savor the experience. After all, you never know when you might have the chance to visit that particular place again.
I love to explore when I travel. I love to find new places to see and new things to do. I always feel so excited when I'm planning my trip and researching where I'm going. I love to read about the history of the places I'm visiting and learn about the culture. I also love to take pictures and share my experiences with my friends and family. I always make sure to leave plenty of time for exploring when I travel. I love to wander around and get lost in new places. I find that the best way to really see a place is to just walk around and explore. I love to people watch and see how locals live. I also love to try new food and drink. I always feel so happy and alive when I'm exploring a new place. I love the feeling of excitement and adventure. I always come home from my travels feeling like I've really experienced something new and different. There are so many memories that make me feel good. It's hard to choose just one, but if I had to, I would say it was the time when I was surrounded by my friends and family. We were all laughing and joking and having the time of our lives. It felt like nothing could bring us down. We were just in the moment and enjoying each other's company. It's moments like that which make me appreciate life and all the good things in it. I know that memories like that will stay with me forever and I will always look back on them fondly. They remind me of the good times and how lucky I am to have such amazing people in my life. I'm grateful for all the happy memories I have and I know that they will continue to bring a smile to my face for years to come. Now, let me tell you about Miles. Miles was always a special cat monkey. From a young age, it was clear that he had an extraordinary gift. He had photographic memory. He could remember every single detail of everything he saw, heard or experienced. This made him an amazing learner and he quickly mastered any skill or task he put his mind to. As he grew older, Miles used his incredible memory to his advantage. He became a world-renowned professor, sharing his knowledge with others and helping them to reach their full potential. He also used his powers of recall to write best-selling books and solve complex problems that had baffled other people for years. People were fascinated by Miles and his abilities, but he was always humble about his talents. He saw himself as just a normal cat monkey, albeit one with an exceptional memory. One day, Miles was approached by a group of scientists who wanted to study him and his abilities in greater detail. They ran a series of tests on him and were amazed by the results. They concluded that his memory was indeed photographic and that he was able to recall information with total accuracy. The scientists were amazed by Miles and his abilities and they continued to study him for many years. They eventually published their findings in a groundbreaking book which helped to change the way people thought about memory and learning. Miles was happy to have helped the scientists, and he continued to use his photographic memory to make a difference in the world. 
He will always be remembered as an extraordinary cat monkey with a gift that was truly unique. Miles was always a bit of an odd name. It wasn't terribly common, but it wasn't unheard of either. It was just different. And that was something that young Miles always loved. He loved that his name was different, that it set him apart from all the other kids in his class. It made him feel special, like he had something that nobody else did. As he got older, Miles realized that his name could be both a blessing and a curse. On the one hand, it was still unique and he loved that. But on the other hand, people often mispronounced it or spelled it wrong. He got used to people calling him Miles or Milo or even Miley. But overall, Miles loved his name. It was a part of him and it always would be. And he would always be proud to be a little bit different. Nicknames are funny. Most people have at least one nickname. Nicknames are usually given to us by our friends, family, or even strangers. They can be based on our real name, our personality, our looks, or something random. Often, we end up with multiple nicknames over the course of our lives. Some people love their nicknames and embrace them wholeheartedly. Others hate them and try to get rid of them as soon as possible. And then there are those who fall somewhere in between, who don't mind a nickname or two but wouldn't want everyone to call them by one. There are all sorts of nicknames, from the cute and clever to the insulting and demeaning. And while some nicknames are given in jest, others can be quite hurtful. Nicknames can be a way to show affection or friendship, but they can also be used to bully or tease someone. So what makes a good nickname? It depends on who you ask. Some people prefer nicknames that are based on their name, like Kitty for Catherine or Bunny for Stephanie. Others prefer nicknames that describe their personality, like Sunshine or Bubbly. And then there are those who prefer nicknames that are just random, like Chicken or Banana. I had a friend once, and he was called Briefly Good Looking. He stopped being my friend a few weeks ago. I only missed him briefly. Ultimately, it's up to the person to decide what they want to be called. And if you don't like your nickname, you can always try to get rid of it. But be warned, once a nickname sticks, it can be very hard to shake. There are many reasons why people may want to change their name. Maybe they didn't like their given name, or maybe they want to start fresh after a major life event. No matter the reason, changing one's name is a big decision that should not be taken lightly. In this essay, we'll explore the process of changing names, from legally changing your name to simply changing the name you go by. If you want to change your name legally, you'll need to file a petition with the court in your jurisdiction. 
The requirements for this vary by state, but generally you'll need to be at least 18 years old and a resident of the state in which you're filing. You'll also need to provide a reason for changing your name, and you may be required to publish a notice of your name change in a local newspaper. Once you've filed your petition and it's been approved by the court, you'll be issued a new birth certificate with your new name. If you're not looking to change your name legally, but just want to go by a different name, you don't need to do anything official. You can start using your new name right away and simply introduce yourself as your new name to family and friends. You may want to start using your new name professionally as well, such as on your resume or business cards. If you have any legal documents with your old name on them, you can usually get them updated with your new name by contacting the relevant agency or company and requesting a name change. Changing your name, whether legally or not, is a big decision. But it can be a rewarding one, and it's a great way to start fresh or to finally be the person you've always wanted to be. When it comes to choosing a name for a new dog, there are a lot of factors to consider. For example, you'll want to choose a name that is easy for your dog to learn and respond to. For instance, the name Biubanibababibini is too complicated for a dog to learn. At the same time, you'll want to pick a name that you feel comfortable calling out in public. For instance, the name Shicho would make you feel uncomfortable to yell in public. And, of course, you'll want to choose a name that you simply like. There are a few different approaches that you can take when it comes to choosing a name for your new dog. One option is to choose a name based on your dog's appearance. For example, if your dog is small and white, you might choose a name like Snowball or Cotton. If your dog is big and black, you might choose a name like Midnight or Bear. Another option is to choose a name based on your dog's personality. For example, if your dog is playful and energetic, you might choose a name like Bam Bam or Siggy. If your dog is calm and laid back, you might choose a name like Shadow or Buddy. Ultimately, the best way to choose a name for your new dog is to go with something that you feel good about. Take a name that you think suits your dog well and that you'll be happy calling out for years to come. When it comes to picking the right dog, there are a number of important factors to consider. First and foremost, you need to think about what kind of lifestyle you live and whether or not a dog will fit into it. For example, do you live in a small apartment or house? Do you have a backyard? How much time are you willing to spend exercising your dog each day? Do you have other pets? Assuming you've decided that you do indeed want a furry friend, the next step is to choose what kind of dog is right for you. This can be a difficult decision, as there are so many different breeds out there, each with their own unique set of characteristics. However, there are a few key things to keep in mind that will help you narrow down your choices. First, think about what size of dog you're looking for. Do you want a small lap dog that you can easily carry around with you, or are you looking for a larger companion to take on hikes and runs? There are pros and cons to both sides, so it's important to decide what's right for you. Next, consider the activity level of the dog you want. 
Some breeds are known for being high energy, while others are more laid back. If you're someone who likes to be constantly on the go, a high energy breed may be a good fit. However, if you're looking for a more low-key pet, a calmer breed may be a better choice. Finally, consider what kind of temperament you're looking for in a dog. Some breeds are known for being friendly and outgoing, while others are more reserved. Again, there's no right or wrong answer here, it's simply a matter of preference. Once you've considered all of these factors, you should have a better idea of what kind of dog is right for you. From there, it's simply a matter of doing some research on your favorite breeds and finding a reputable breeder or rescue organization to adopt from. With a little patience and effort, you're sure to find the perfect furry friend to join your family. Now this is the end of the episode. Good night.